Hello, everyone, and welcome to Political Paradigm. It feels good to be back. A very special thank you to Victor for holding down while I was away. On Political Paradigm, we focus on political matters and, in most cases, governance, because, as they say, after politics comes the aspect of governance. Today, I am joined by a two term member of the House of Representatives, former member, to be specific, member of the House of Representatives, who played a key role towards the end of the Ninth House of Representatives with regard to an investigation. We'll speak to him on a plethora of issues today. My guest is Honorable Mark Wheeler, who represented Gwe East and West in the nine, Eighth and Ninth House of Representatives. Honorable, welcome to Political Party. Thank you very much, Terry. The pleasure is all mine. It's good to see you again. I'll be honest with you. Uh, uh, it, I think it's safe to say they miss you in the house. <laughs> I, I hope they do. You hope to do so. How have you been? How have you been since uh, after politics? I just simply ask you, how's it been since leaving the House of Representatives? You spent two terms there, and now you're a former lawmaker. How's it been for you? Okay, um, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it's important to point out that um, I am in the tribunal because I ran for the Senate of Benue Northwest Zone B in Benue State. And um, I had my reservations about who was declared the winner. So that case is still at the tribunal and we're awaiting judgment. So that is part of what I've been up to since I have not been in the house. But apart from that, obviously, I took time out for a holiday with my family because uh, a lot of times Nigerians don't know when we look after the affairs of the country, sometimes our private time and our time with our family suffers. So that's part of what I've taken time out to do. Then apart from that, obviously, I have also been observing, you know, the new administration, both in the state and in the federal government. And as a member of the opposition, we have been trying to fashion out patriotic and very innovative ways of keeping this administration at all levels honest. And one of the things that I have been trying to study from the UK's example is the issue of a shadow government. I think it's something that uh, a lot of times the opposition doesn't bother to do in Nigeria, which is critical. And this is something that we're working on as former members and as members of the opposition. And it's something that at the highest level of our party, the Labour Party, we're going to start to discuss to engage this government we will have our own shadow ministers for each portfolio. We'll have our own representatives, even at the state level, to be able to proffer solutions to the issues that Nigerians have so that they can see that as an alternative way. This is something we haven't done. And with the cooperation of the media, of course, it will help to put the news out there that there's a different way things can be done if it's not being done the way Nigerians expect it to be. Absolutely. Uh, let's 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 do a little housekeeping uh, for you now. You spent two terms in the House of Representatives as a member of the People's Democratic Party. The one time you switched to the Labour Party and tried to run on the platform, you couldn't return to the National Assembly. Could you talk to us through the process of uh, switching from one party to the other and the outcome of the result, even though I know that you're in court at the moment? Okay, thank you. So let me uh, put it in the right perspective, Terry. My first election was actually on the platform of the APC. Okay. So we were the ones who brought the change to Nigerians when President Muhammad Buhari was running. We had a lot of faith in the government and we, I am happy to say, were pioneer members of the initiative to bring true change to the Nigerian polity. So I actually won my first election under the APC. Now, an issue that bedevils the development of democracy and partisan politics in Nigeria is the issue of godfatherism, the issue of individuals who have a dictatorial hold on political parties and political associations. Now, and that is where you start to have the problem of people leaving a political party because they see that there's a concerted effort to frustrate their good intention and that's what happened to some of us so from the APC I had to leave 
to the PDP. I'm sure you're aware of the time when the RAPC came up, the, yes. the faction. We actually drove that process from the National Assembly. And that's when we all went to the PDP because we were, you know, disillusioned about the trajectory our government in the APC then was going. Some of us believe in speaking truth to power. You can see that we were vindicated at the end of the day. Because if you look at the scorecard of the last administration, a lot of what we had proposed and promised Nigerians we could not achieve as the APC at the time. So this is part of what we have a problem with in Nigeria, where people are not, there's not a completely democratic process in the political parties as had yet. You still have demigods in court, individuals who are larger than life, who influence the processes. So that's also what happened to me even in the PDP, why I had to leave and join the Labour Party. And I must say that it's in the Labour Party that we are now having a semblance of freedom of expression as members of the party, so where there's it's no... Not, it's not too early to call? No, no, it's not too early because we don't have any of those kind of individuals at our state level and at the national level who want to breathe down upon you and dominate and control and impose. This is what you see in some but of then, these other parties. But then the party is still budding. It hasn't really... Uh, oh, yeah, and then, but fortunately, we are leaders of the party. So because I do not espouse those kind of political conducts by politicians, I can say that we will not let that happen in Benin because I can very confidently tell you I am a leader of the party in Benue. So we do not have such individuals. I do not have any intention of imposing candidates, of wanting to control and dictate who becomes what. No, this is where we have to start to get the foundation right. And at the national level, you can see that it is extraneous factors that are trying to influence the harmony that we have in Labour Party, but they will not succeed. Fortunately, the courts are there to, us, to uphold justice, and they have already started ruling in favor of the correct and factual chairman of the Labour Party. And you can see that at that level, at the national level, the presidential candidate is not an individual to impose or dictate to people. The chairman himself is not. So you see, we're trying to build a party that Nigerians will see is the alternative to these parties where they can, even the layman on the street can begin to call you the, the names in the party that determine what happens in the party. You know, and that is not the kind of foundation that we want to build in the Labour Party. Well, speaking about foundation, let, let's look at um, how it played out for you in the primaries while you were in the APC. Look at what played out uh, in the primaries during the, when you were in the PDP. Before we talk about the Labour Party, let me ask you to tie that to the issue of Godfatherism, which you pointed out. How did you emerge in the APC, in the PDP, and what exactly happened uh, that led to you leaving People's Democratic Party to join the Labour Party in this last election. Okay, so thank you very much. So let me start. Um, I want to tell Nigerians that politics in Nigeria can be done without compromise, without buying votes, without any untoward action on the part of the politician. And I am a testament to that fact. From the APC primaries, Fortunately, I was from the part of the local government that was supposed to, you know, we have this equitable distribution of political positions, which some people like to call zoning, but I like to look at as something that enhances equity amongst diverse people in any society. So. I was fortunately from that part. So my primaries in the APC, my, for my initial election, I was, you know, um, unopposed. That's the popular political term we use. I was unopposed. 
So I had a smooth experience there, of course, with the support of the leadership of the party in the state at the time. You know, but what starts to happen is that when you emerge in a political position, those who believe they supported you start to have expectations, you know, that are beyond normal gratification that they expect. Certain individuals felt I needed to empower them economically, which is not what my mandate was. Certain people started wanting to dictate to me what it was I would say on the floor and not say. You know, this is the problem we're having as a country where those who are in office, you know, are controlled, remote controlled, so to say, to say what they want to say, they have to go back to a certain leader or godfather and find out if it's okay for him to take this position. You know, everything is becoming so mundane. Now, after that started to happen in the APC, of course, that's when there was that movement for us to leave, to go to the PDP. My first primary in the PDP, yes, I had opponents, but there was a general support too from the leadership of the party and the people in the party themselves because they felt a second term is better because of legislative experience and the benefit to the constituency. And that is something that we have not begun to understand as a people in Nigeria. This whole issue of it's our turn, it's our turn, is destroying our legislature and it's destroying the development of the statutes of our country because the legislature enforces the constitution in a lot of ways, you know. So it was after that ex initial time in the PDP it was my second primary in the PDP that I had the experience of certain members of the leadership of this party in the state being against my candidature because they now felt, you know, what's, what's the word you use here now, afraid of the fact that I was trying to assume political relevance, I'll be a third term member and I would have more clout to contest certain elections against them, you know. And then, of course, the whole issue of it's our turn factor came in on the other hand. And some of us tried to promote to the people the fact that when you come back to the house, you even have more clout and more ability to influence the benefits that should come to your community and your constituency. So somehow there was uh, some persons wanted rotation within your federal constituency. Yes, naturally. But there was no initial agreement to that. No, there wasn't. There wasn't. And that is something that we tried to make very clear to them. There was no agreement to say, okay, we'll go two, two terms. There was no such agreement. And there was also the influence of, like I said, this is very important. I don't want to call any names, but leaders of the party in the state that orchestrated the outcome of the primaries against some of us. And then, of course, we in the National Assembly shot ourselves in the foot. You know, at the time, it was basically the, um, the national chairman and um, the who is from your state. Yes. And then you had the state governor, who is a, a member of the PDP as well. Did you have their support as well? Well, you are trying to uh, <laughs> put words in my mouth terrible. Let me say this. For someone who stood with the party, when there were some rogue, permit me to use that term, members of the party, when we were transitioning to the Ninth Assembly. I'm sure I remember a lot of PDP members supported the candidate of the APC against the position of the party. But some of us who felt like loyal party members, I could have done that to curry favor. Of course, my standing with my party didn't favor me because I wasn't given a chairmanship or deputy chairmanship position. But that is not what I was after. I was after character, integrity, and loyalty. And I stood with the party, so you would expect that when it came for the party to reciprocate, the national chairman himself did not say anything in our favor. The governor, it is alleged, is one of those who was instrumental in my not emerging because after the primaries, and I make bold to say this, elders in my community sat down for my local government, and then that's when they started to accuse themselves if you knew the governor was not in support of Bila. Why didn't you tell him so he doesn't waste his time 
you know, to start to emerge. And those are the problems we have with our fledgling democracy. When individuals and governors can influence and affect the outcome because of pecuniary interests and pecuniary inducements. You know, you know in politics, it's understandable that there are interests. And most importantly, there's dialogue as to explain to the people involved why certain decisions would be taken. And I understand there are meetings. In fact, that's exactly what played out uh, in the leadership tussle in the House of Representatives or perhaps National Assembly to be specific, where the candidates felt that the party, it wasn't your party, of course, but the APC at the time didn't consult with them and went ahead to make those decisions. Were you consulted with? No, that's part of the problem I'm saying. I, on my own, made the initiative of going to the governor on my own, his, his wife, to say, okay, these are my intentions because I think it's in the best interest of the constituency because if I come back as a third-term member, I can, you know, run for leadership position. I'll be qualified to do that, you know, and I felt it would be to the benefit of the constituency and the state. There are a lot of things that they can attest to that I have been able to influence in the state, which a first-term member will be unable to do. Very and, well. um, you know, so, but of course, we must also, uh, you know, not forget that the National Assembly shot itself in the foot when we did not handle the issue of the Electoral Act properly. The lacuna that we allowed for the number of people who eventually became delegates for the primary also did not work, you know, to our advantage. Honorable, let's talk a little about um, national issues now. Uh, you said you've had your eyes on the administration, the Tinubu administration, and you have some concerns. Uh, I know it's just about three months. There are those who say it's too early to call, but a cabinet's now been formed, and it's expected that they will actualize the promises and policies of the Tinubu administration. So just to set a background on this particular uh, topic, what are your thoughts on the administration of President Bola Tinubu so far? Okay, so um, let me say that uh, there are certain commendable developments, but they are also not so commendable and some outrightly wrong, you know, actions that have been playing out. Now, let me start to quickly itemize them. The pronouncement of the removal of world subsidy without any palliatives or any plans to cushion the effect of was the first fundamental flaw that has thrown the country now into a roller coaster that we're still trying to recover from and then going ahead to um, do what they did in regards to the exchange rate of the Naira in the parallel market. You know, all of that all at once in an economy like ours was not the best decision to make. So the policies were good, but all at once. Exactly. The policies were good. I have been an ardent supporter of the removal of subsidy. I have done, like you rightly said, some investigations in those areas and I've seen that there was a lot of corruption and fraud going on with regards to the issue of subsidy. Now, it, it's not encouraging to Nigerians when a new administration does not appear to have its act together to know that there are examples around the world. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. You and I can Google it and see that India had the same situation and they put certain things in place, EMAS initiative and other things in place before the removal that cushioned the effect. Right now it's as if we're working after the fact. You know, it's now damage controlled. We're not being proactive, we're being reactive. And then you now start to bring up things like the initial one which they have jettisoned, that also shows you there's no coordination. Which one? The 8,000 naira per household that they wanted to do per month, you know? Well, believe, but that's still being reviewed, isn't it? Well, <laughs> in, my own, in my own opinion, <laughs> well, no, in my own opinion, I don't believe it will be reviewed because they know it doesn't make any sense. Who sat down and thought about that? Now, that's a concern because for some of us who you know, by the grace of God, 
our entrepreneurs before we became politicians, when professional parties worked in blue chip companies before we came into politics, we understand planning strategy. So when a government makes these decisions that are flawed, you are worried. Then you now come and say you want to give five billion to each state. Is it the same state governments that have not shown a level of transparency and accountability that you're putting that into their hands? Now, this is what happened in the previous administration. If you remember, they wanted to bring 20,000 for three months for people. Do you remember? That's the, was it was six months, I think, the 774,000 local... Local governments, exactly. Yeah, public uh -huh. works program. Public yes. works program, which I believe is still related to what uh, now Minister Kayamo was trying to apologize for. And that's another issue some of us have issues with. What, do you, what are you apologizing for? You have done a lot of damage to the people. What are you going to come and do differently by giving or tendering an apology? That's another issue. We have to have time, we'll discuss that. But let me just itemize this quickly. There are certain initiatives that can be done with that money. In each local government, this is what I had a press release that was issued some time ago when this public works issue came up. And I said, the money they wanted to use, and I'm saying this to this government as well, this money they're saying five billion, they can translate into one product, one cottage industry per local government across the country that will provide gainful employment and be a source of economic benefit and provision to the people. So you can have a, a rice meal, you can have something that enhances the potential of each local government, this amount they're intending to use can do that. I think 185 billion now can set up industries in 774 local government areas of the country. Well, it depends on what kind of industry and what amount you want to use. At the time, depending on what the total amount is now, you say 185 billion? Well, it's uh, in the region thereabouts. But yes, it can. If you say you want to deploy five billion to a state like Benue, for instance, we have 23 uh, local government areas, right? So um, at, uh, let's say, a, 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 a hundred million, for instance, will be 2.3 billion. Thereabouts. So double that, 200. Thank you. Now, can't you set up? The last calculation we did, it was actually going to be with the initial public works amount. It was actually just about 70 million. But now you're dealing with about 100 million. In fact, 200 million in a state like Benway. Obviously, Terry, you and I know that that can set up a, a proper company, you know, with the ability to be sustainable with the ability to be productive and to the benefit of the people and taking benefit of the immediate but, but, resources. But how does that answer the immediate hunger concerns? Because if you realize what that five billion is for, it is for provision of food items, grains, rice, maize, fertilizers. So how does setting up an industry with this palliative measure address immediate concerns of hunger? Okay, now, we must always, as a country, stop this emergency and reactive responses to issues when the damage has been done. We must always step back. And this is why we have not been managing our resources properly. I hear you, I feel you, but five billion you and I know is still not going to solve the issue. We need to start to look at long-term solutions. I feel with you, my Nigerian brothers and sisters, I feel the pain, I feel, I understand that, but we need something that will transcend the immediate situation. So we throw away 185 billion or, or more in a hurry, trying to intervene, when we could have stepped back, done a proper plan, and then done something that will outlive several administrations. Just like we had the legacy at one point, I don't know if it was under Babangida's administration or so, 
when they built these, uh, they were like, uh, I think it was INEC or so places in every local government or so. They had these buildings they did for, I think it was for the election body, though, that they built them. They achieved something that still exists till today and they are being used for other things now. It's something similar, I'm trying to say. You take a step back and do something that is sustainable to the benefit of the people and they themselves will appreciate you more than wanting to give them handouts that would fritter away in a short while and you'll have spent all that money with nothing tangible to show for it. Honorable, let me just quickly ask you this question before as we wrap up this conversation so I can take my next guest. You uh, were part of the... You headed the committee, actually, that investigated uh, stolen crude oil theft, I think valued at about $2.4 billion. Yes. How did you receive the news of the federal government's decision to reconsider partial petrol subsidy? No, I was quite shocked. And that's also part of what is my own disappointment with this administration that seems to be flip-flopping in their policy decisions. If you make a decision, you stand by it, and it shows the level of acumen you have in your administration when you make a decision and you have those who can proffer solutions to it. For you to start flip-flopping, going back again to provide partial subsidy, it shows still a very large level of confusion. Now, I commend the president for making that decision, but I think he needs the right people. And there are people out there, it shouldn't always be about those in my political party. A lot of us are willing to assist, to provide solutions. A lot of people out there are willing to do so. Let us go back to the politics. That's why I commend the fact that people like former Governor Rivers are in the government. I think he's the only person, though, that maybe because of his more vocal and visible support was considered. But he should open it up to a lot of people who have solutions. You know, the, 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 the presidential candidate of the, the, the Labour Party himself has shown the willingness to provide some advice. But this whole issue of always sticking to political lackeys, political associates, loyalists, and they don't bring anything new to the table. So I was quite worried and concerned. After, by the way, the investigation showed that there was no such issue of $2.4 billion missing. That was just a figment of some people's imagination. But where there but was actually- it doesn't actually, take away the fact that crude oil has always been stolen from- Exactly, and that's what I was trying to say now. But it doesn't take, and that's another investigation that still we recommended then the next National Assembly needs to continue. The actual issue of stolen crude, which some international bodies have already identified through searchlight imagery of vessels that left Nigeria, docked on the sea, emptied some of their crew before getting to their last destination, crew that arrived in America without corresponding documentation or corresponding quantities being declared in Nigeria. So there's that issue that is continuously going on in Nigeria, actually. Very well, and Honorable Mark Miller, former member of the House of Representatives, thank you for your time. And I wish you well at the tribunal. Thank you very um, much, sir. I let's see if it. we'll talk as a senator next time I see you. By the grace of God. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, you'll meet my next guest. He's also a former member of the House of Representatives. Please stay with us. Mm -hmm.